Uh, let me uh, also re remind you again that you have, uh, everybody has cards at their table, so if they have a question, um, please write it down and we will have uh, people coming around uh, to collect it. Can I, can I have your attention, please? It's really a great pleasure uh, uh, to have as our, as our dinner speaker this year, uh, Philip Falcone, who, uh, who's the chief executive officer and the chief investment officer of Harbinger Capital Partners, uh, which he formed in, in 2001. Uh, Phil grew up in Minnesota. He was a, uh, a standout hockey player. Uh, he went on to Harvard where he earned a, a degree in economics and played hockey and then he played uh, professional hockey in Sweden um, for a year uh, before going to Wall Street uh, where he has uh, accumulated over uh, two decades experience in leveraged finance, distressed debt, and special situations. As, as you, most of you probably know, Harbinger is a key financial backer uh, of Light Squared, uh, a company that uh, currently provides satellite uh, communication services to first responders and public safety officials across the country and that has been working to develop a uh, wholesale nation nationwide 4G LTE wireless uh, broadband network uh, using a combination of terrestrial and uh, satellite net networks. Obviously, this is all relevant. There's been a lot of discussion this morning about spectrum and wireless issues, and of course, this is very relevant uh, to that. Uh, Phil has been investing in, uh, in the telecommunications industry for over a decade. Uh, these uh, investments have led to the development of cutting-edge technologies that promote spectral efficiency, such as a chipset that allows for seamless communications between satellite and ground services uh, in a single mobile device. So it is a uh, great pleasure to, prevent, uh, to, to present uh, Phil Falcone. Thank you, Tom, for that kind in introduction. I um, hope everybody had in is enjoying their possum tonight. Tom convinced me it was elk, but I refused to believe him. So. Anyhow, it's great to be here, um, um, and I'm honored to be asked to speak tonight. Uh, the Technology Policy Institute does extremely important work to inform and educate policymakers about the impact innovation has on consumers, businesses, and society as a whole. With the pace of digital evolution only quickening, there has never been a more important time for policymakers to closely consider the implications of action or inaction on the American economy. There's no doubt that we're engaged in the global battle the new great engine for economic growth. So I thank Tom and TPI for having me um, present today. This evening I will share some perspective about broadband based on my experience as an entrepreneur and investor and while, why I believe this sector is a sector worth continued and significant investment. Key fundamentals have guided my investment decisions over the years, and in wireless, the supply and demand characteristics created a unique opportunity for me. But there were also elements of the mission that really resonated with the life I knew growing up. I grew up, as Tom mentioned, in Minnesota, in actually a remote part of the state, in a small rural town in northern Minnesota called Chisholm on the Iron Range. Growing up as the youngest of a family of nine, education was clearly important to us. I read a lot and studied hard, but I learned most about myself from my brothers and sisters and from playing ice hockey. After a lot of work and support, I was ultimately afforded the opportunity to attend Harvard University where I managed to spend four years on the varsity hockey team. Looking back, I can tell you that were it not for hockey and my family, I would not have had the life-changing opportunity to attend Harvard and probably wouldn't be standing before you tonight. But back then, the playing field, especially in the classroom, was a bit more level. Unlike today, where there exists a stark divide between rural and urban America, not only in the classroom, but on many levels. 
My mom still lives on the range, and when I go home to visit, I always get a fresh reminder of this divide, which seems to be increasing with every trip that I make back home. Families are moving away in search of opportunity, and today there aren't even enough kids to assemble a hockey team, let alone keep the schools open. I give a lot of credit in the divide, especially when it comes to education and access to information. And when it comes to technology back home, you would be lucky if one bar lit up on your cell phone. I experienced that just last week when I intended, attended my high school reunion. Seriously though, that's a problem. A level playing field in the wireless technology is no longer a given. In cities and towns across this country, particularly in rural America, access to a good education is hard to find. Access to information through cutting edge technology can help and should help that change, but not if we fail to address the inequality of broadband wireless access across our country. It is simply unacceptable that America is leaving communities like Chisholm behind in terms of te technology and hence education. This is very personal for me. My daughters will start the second grade this fall, and I'm sure your kids and grandkids do. They use technology every day to understand the world around them. Whether it's searching for Im information on animals or insects, or even Harry Potter, the access is at their fingertips. So I believe more than ever that we have a strong moral imperative to invest in the American tele te telecommunications infrastructure to improve access to information and bridge the gap between urban and rural America. We need to offer all kids the same opportunities and experiences that many of us take for granted today. I want to help break down the barriers to education and once again level that playing field that I enjoyed so, small, so kids in small towns like Chisholm have the same opportunities that my kids have growing up in New York City. Of course, the benefits of wireless broadband extend beyond educational opportunity. Broadband creates jobs, raises productivity, and counters rural urban migration, bringing growth to many areas that have been stagnant or shrinking for years. As one ag, ag executive recently mentioned to me, 30 years ago, rural America needed the agricultural industry to survive. Now the agriculture industry needs rural America to survive. Needless to say, the necessity to access goes beyond the need to just checking your Facebook page. The implications are staggering. Through smart investments in technology and stable regulatory policies, we can bring world-class wireless broadband to every corner of the country. Many of you are involved in that effort, and I applaud you for it. And like many of you, I want to be part of this uniquely creative period in American history, and I saw an opportunity to be part of the solution. That brings me to the investment thesis that led me to this sector years ago. Wireless infrastructure showed explosive growth in the late 90s, but Consumer adoption still remained relatively low, and I believe the potential for, for further growth remained. This growth, however, relied on, on available spectrum, what I like to call a finite lease resource, and a resource that I like to call the highway in the sky. Rising demand versus too little supply of a key input created a very real opportunity for me as an investor. I began looking at technologies that could improve help improve spectral efficiencies, and then studied how to deploy these technologies in an economical way to bring wireless service to even the most remote locations in our country. What I'm saying now is not new to you. However, I think it is fair to say that it was hard to predict how strong demand would, would skyrocket from back then. 15 years ago, the world had not been introduced to Google. But early broadband deployments suggested that whatever its uses, widely available broadband would enable growth and a generation of new businesses, and in doing so, boost the quality of life for all families. Today, we live in a world where Google is not just a company, but also a verb. And global mobile data volumes are now more than doubling every year. 
putting increasing strain on the wireless infrastructure. Just think about the numbers for a second. Smartphones consume 24 times more data than traditional cell phones. Tablets use 122 times more data than traditional cell phones. As commonplace as these devices may seem, the U.S. market continues to have enormous growth potential. Half of all Americans with a cell phone do not yet have a smartphone, but their next phone is likely to be one. And demand is showing no signs of leveling out. In the last year, the U.S. exceeded 100% mobile phone penetration, meaning that there is one mobile phone for every person in the U.S. We crossed that threshold at about the same time as Mumbai. Brazil is currently at 132% and Russia is at 150%. As more Americans purchase smartphones and tablets, wireless traffic will rise. It will continue to rise as high bandwidth applications for devices continue to expand and video traffic and cloud-based services gain in popularity, two areas where we have barely scratched the surface. Consumers today look at these various mobile services to stay connected to the world, provided they have the connectivity. We've all read stories about how iPhone users saw their data use doubling, in some cases tripling, when they upgraded to the iPhone 4S because the new iPhone included more features. But even though this is new, the basic rules of economics continue to apply. When demand rises, supply must rise with it or else price will rise. Unless enough spectrum comes, comes online fast enough to meet this rising demand, Companies will be forced to reevaluate price structures, leading to data caps and increased prices for consumers. We're seeing that principle in action with tiered pricing today. Wireless company, companies are essentially charging users for more, more for consuming bandwidth. But I don't know a single economist who thinks tiered pricing is going to significantly slow the explosion in demand. What we have seen instead is an explosion of new products and devices entering the marketplace, only to further increase demand. However, we are facing an inflection point in wireless where every estimate out there indicates that existing wireless infrastructure will run out of capacity in a very short time. Even if you take into account every conceivable expansion of capacity currently under consideration, the alarming fact is that we're probably looking at demand exceeding supply in less than two years. So where will the new supply come from? With wireless broadband, it's not as simple as building more factories and, or importing new product from overseas. You'd need more spectrum and more efficient technology. Technology improvements will come in time, but physics play a role and will limit the effectiveness. Assigning new spectrum to wireless broadband however, is quite challenging. I personally can attest to that. But we need to find a way, because what happens, what happens when demand exceeds supply? Wireless devices still operate, just not as well. Downloads and uploads will take longer. Signals will be harder to find. Calls will be dropped. Innovation will ultimately slow if the proper medium is not in place. Current wireless networks won't have enough spectrum to serve everyone. Prices will rise and those Americans at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder will lose out. And we cannot afford to let this happen. So what does it mean for a technology policy? There's great urgency to get this right. The wireless infrastructure in this country is at a breaking point. The U.S. must stay focused and on maintaining a regulatory framework that encourages private investment, and not just through an auction process where there will likely only be two participants. Investment in infrastructure that brings access to all people in an economic manner is crucial to America retaining its global competitiveness. And make no mistake, the policy choices today will not only affect the growth of our dig digital economy tomorrow, but for decades. The United States has been a leader in showing the rest of the world what a well-regulated telecom market should look like, it is imperative that it continues. Wireless broadband is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. Certainly, I believe it is the most cost-effective way to deliver broadband services to underserved areas. 
Thankfully, the digital divide promises to narrow to some extent, due in part to existing private investment in supportive government policies. Many of you in the room have been responsible for these positive regulatory steps. But none of the things the history of technology teaches us, one of the things that history of technology teaches us is that you can't stop while you're making progress. We can't allow the creation of new wireless digital divide as a result of the spectrum crunch. We need every American to have equal access to the world-changing technology. Entrepreneurs, investors, investors, businesses large and small can and should operate in a variety of policy environments. However, the most important conditions we need, the conditions that will create low-risk environmental environment that attracts dollars are stability and consistency. Without both, it will become increasingly difficult to deploy capital because of the large risk associated with regulatory inconsistency. If the licensees of spectrum face radical changes in how their spectrum rights are treated, then the additional burden of such regulatory risk may well drive investment to other markets that otherwise would have happened here in the U.S. In that respect, I am encouraged by the recent report of the President's Council on, of Advisors on Science and Technology that raised the possibility of spectrum sharing as a means of getting more spectrum into the market in the short term. Spectrum sharing has been shown to work among commercial users. In the satellite world, we call it coordination, and we've been doing it for decades. At the same time, I also think it makes sense to look at ways to enhance receiver efficiency and improve this technology to make it every bit as good as transmission technology. The technologi technological advances in filter and receiver design made possible by the scale and scope of the cellular industry has had the effect of driving incredible advances in a short period of time. Several studies have been released in recent weeks on the issue and every cost-benefit analysis I've seen has strongly shown that driving more efficient receivers is the right call. So I call on you to ensure a policy environment that supports this critical goal. We know there is a need to get more spectrum in the hands of commercial users now to keep pace with the growing capacity needs. As Tom mentioned earlier, one of my investments in this area is in a company called Light Squared. Over the past year, the conversation with respect to this company has been focused around interference concerns with neighboring bands. As you all know firsthand, interference concerns extend well beyond a single company or band, and as we, we seek to find ways of freeing more spectrum to meet growing broadband needs, either through sharing or clearing, we will need to address these issues in a way that creates certainly certainty and stability for the market. As a country that has always led the world in innovation, innovation and entrepreneurial energy, I am confident that we can solve these issues. And I'm also certain that there is too much at stake if we do not. I want to take the balance of my time up here this evening to focus the conversation on the possibilities this type of business model that we are working on could bring to the market in the very near future if these issues are solved. Using cutting edge satellite technology and a wholesale business model, this type of network could dramatically increase broadband capacity and availability in the next couple of years by providing vital connectivity to any, every corner of the country. This includes much of the population without current access today. Through partnerships not only with existing rural providers, but also through the non-traditional providers like retailers. Over the past 10 years, some of the best and the brightest engineers in our country worked to develop state-of-the-art technology that allows seamless communication between a satellite and a ground network to a single mobile phone. This technology provides wireless coverage no matter where you are in the United States and up to 200 miles offshore. Whether you are in the deep forest in northern Minnesota or trying to stay connected, during your commute in Denver, Dallas, or DC, or even in Aspen, this new dual-mode chipset could be embedded in a smartphone to provide coverage when a tower is not available. Think about the possibility this could create for public safety and first responders, a true meaning to a nationwide network. 
Today, Light Squared provides mobile satellite services to hundreds of thousands of customers via our two satellites. Federal, state, and local governments, public safety, and first rep responders throughout the country have benefited from the use of these satellites and our services. And is, it is the only network to provide push-to-talk voice that is interoperable with any other user of the network anywhere. But let's face it, satellite voice and data are still niche services that a very small number of consumers actually use. And to many, it sounds crazy that it will be anything but that. But why does it sound crazy? We're all used to satellite television and radio. It has been made affordable for consumers and brought amazing benefits. The te technology developed over the last decade changes all that and can be used to port support sub public safety efforts today that's paid for not on a standalone basis, but as part of a much lar larger ground network. Simply put, first responders could have available satellite communications in the palms of their hands for the same cost as a consumer phone and be utilized in an uninterrupted manner during a natural or unnatural disaster when the towers are down. In addition to satellite technology, a wholesale model could change how a wireless company or even a non-wireless company reaches customers. Anyone who wants to reach a customer over wireless would have the ability to do so via capacity on the, wire, on the light squared wireless network. Whether that's a large established wireless company, a small rural wireless company, a retailer or a device manufacturer, dozens of new competitors will emerge in the marketplace. How do I know this? because we had over 40 of these types of customers signed up before we even got a chance to get out of the starting blocks. Think of this model in the same way a typical consumer products company thinks of a rail system or a trucking system. It's merely a means of transport. Wireless should be no different. Imagine if each consumer products company or any manufacturer for that matter had to build their own transportation network. Where would the ingenuity and innovation be? Most would be barely able to survive if they survive at all. Sound familiar? Why should that be any different for any entity, whether a wireless company or not, that wants to transmit data? The network is the commodity. The product is the ingenuity. If your comp core competency is handling or marketing to retail customers, Having bricks and mortar and conducting all of the marketing and investment required to do that, this model lets businesses continue to do what they are good at while giving them access to a network with adequate capacity, owner economics, and most importantly, control over their customer relationships. The FCC has worked very hard over many years to try to open up roaming access, first for voice service and more recently for data services. Wouldn't it be nice to have a market-based source or grid for wireless capacity for everyone so these regulations would serve as a backstop only if necessary? And finally, think about the possibilities an open access platform creates. A new market for device, devices and wireless applications for developers to launch new businesses. The launch of innovation sandboxes where anyone can walk in, sign up for time, on a fully functional test range and test out whatever equipment they want. The testing today is available to large companies, but a wholesale business model allows the option to put in the hands of every investor and entrepreneur. These are the kinds of positive things that I like to think about and to focus on. It's really why I got involved in telecommunications so many years ago, because of the ability to build technology to change our world for the better. Light Squared today continues to engage with all stakeholders to identify alternatives that would allow us to deploy this network in the near future and to also protect the concerns ra raised by the GPS community. We are encouraged by the Commission's recent willingness to look at alternative spectrum to address concerns in other bands, and we believe this framework could be applied to Light Squared as an effective way to free up more spectrum for American consumers in a short period of time. The stakes are simply too high for us not to find a solution. 
not the stakes for the company or for me, the stakes for our economy on the whole. There is tremendous opportunity here, though, and that opportunity should be a beacon for private investment. Certainly, it's the right thing to do to invest in American competitiveness and innovation. It will change and improve the lives of little girls in New York or a little boy in rural Minnesota, at least when he is not on the ice. Thank you. Well, that was great. A couple, few questions. Will you take a few questions? Sure. Okay. All right. First one. Uh, how long will it take for you to work through the regulatory hurdles? Do you feel confident you will emerge from Chapter 11 and ultimately be successful? Um, yes, I do. I'll answer that from the latter. Um, or I should say from the former. Um, anyhow, yes, I do believe we will exit Chapter 11. Um, we enter Chapter 11, and, and I, am, I have a bankruptcy background, so for me to go into bankruptcy was kind of second nature, because I look at it as a means of protecting um, the assets of the company. Um, there's an automatic stay provision, and you can continue running the company without having any issues. Um, but I do believe that we will exit. Um, as it relates to the regulatory environment, I feel like we're in a good place. We're in a much better place today than we were yesterday, and then we much, much better place than where we were six or eight months ago. Um, I continue to believe the regulatory agencies want to see this get done. I think that um, there were some missteps on, on, on both sides, quite frankly. And I think people are ready to press the reset button because I really do think people um, believe that, that this is important because if this doesn't get done, uh, it's gonna be very difficult for somebody else to step into the marketplace in, the, in, uh, in wireless in the coming years. And I think w one of the lines that I mentioned in the in the in the in the speech was the wireless auctions. Like, who's actually going to show up for a wireless auction today? You're going to have two guys, um, maybe three. But um, and and every day that goes by, that that is going to get more and more and more and more and more difficult. So I think it's imperative, and I really believe that uh, uh, the various constituents. Um, think that this is th this is the right thing. So th there's going to be a lot of wood to chop, there's no question about it, but I believe that we're in a better place today than we were in the past six months. Um, why are you still fighting for this? Um, because I know I'm right. I really do. I, I um, without getting into t to detail, um, I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't have made the investment, and I probably shouldn't go down this path, but <laughs> um, I believe that I'm right. And uh, I, I think rational heads will prevail in the long run. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic about that, and uh, you know, it's my nature to keep fighting, and, I think it's the right thing to do. There's a lot at stake, not only for me personally, but I think more importantly for the competitive environment, for jobs, for innovation. I don't think this country is going to um, start manufacturing T-shirts and get out of the rut that we're in. I think it's going to have to be technological innova innovation, and there's no way around it. So, Well, that's... Good, a good lead into the next uh, question, which is how would you improve tech policy decision making? Can it be improved? <laughs> um, I would probably limit lobbying efforts. Um, I think there's too many um, um, special interest groups that uh, that get involved for 
their own reason. I don't know how you do that, but um, that's been a uh, problem, it seems like, for an awful long time. And there's got to be a better way to, um, to bring new policy along, new technology policy along without uh, special interest groups influencing. Um, I don't exactly know the, the right answer to that, but that's kind of on the nut, in a nutshell how I think about that. Okay, here's a hockey question. <laughs> a little relief. <laughs> I'm a Cornell grad who once upon a day threw a dead fish onto the ice when Harvard skated onto the ice. What was the most difficult arena you played in? Go Big Red. <laughs> you know, I, I remember when I was a freshman and every year we played Colgate Cornell. And when I was a freshman, I got hurt in the Colgate game. I sprained my ankle and I, I could barely stand on it and the coach told me, we're going to line a rink. You don't want to miss this. And I could barely stand, so I thought, okay, I'm going to just wrap it up and tape it up. And they, no cortisone shots, but they wrapped it up where I could barely, uh, barely move. And I um, stepped out on the rink in Cornell, and that was a pretty exciting place to play. And I think we beat them eight to one that night. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this is, this is the last question. Um, or, although maybe the last one should have been the last question. But uh, looking at the evolution of EBIT and EBITDA in the mobile industry, we see increasing dominance by Verizon and AT&T. This suggests that companies like Sprint, T-Mobile, Metro PCS, and Leap just can't compete effectively with their larger competitors. Why did you believe a new entrant could succeed? Because I think that today, when you look at the wireless market, I think we've got it a little bit upside down, and I hope there's no AT&T or Verizon people in here. <laughs> but um, no, None at all. No. <laughs> I, I, I look at the network. The, the network is a railroad. It's a means of transport. The, the genius behind it and the genius of... I think how, how, how some of the new guys today are succeeding is with the applications and um, that's where the innovation is. What we would provide is the dumb pipe. And I think um, what AT&T and Verizon and Sprint and all the other wireless provider have, all, all they have is the dumb pipe. And what differentiates the two is really speed um, and you, you I think today if you especially in New York City if you presented five different five different phones each with five different networks you're gonna ask who has the least calls dropped who has the fastest network and that's it and that's I think the the commoditization of the network but I think that's where it, it, it needs to go for, competitive, for the competitive marketplace to change because there are, and when you think about all the other constituents in the marketplace, there are a lot of non-traditional, and I have my theory on this, that I think you, know, you provide a wireless network to Walmart they'll take over everybody like they typically do they'll you know sell C they'll give CDs away to get somebody um, to buy one of their phones but if people can walk into a retailer and buy a cell phone and walk up to the um, um, uh, c cash register or, or, or register and uh, get immediate connectivity on with low cost that's, I think, what people want, and I think there's that opportunity out there. But today, and you know, more power to Verizon and AT and T. They have, they dominate the network. You want to get access to wire to wireless, you got to go through AT and T and Verizon. And uh, you know, I, 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 
I, I do believe that there's enough demand from the non-traditional providers because there is no reason for a Best Buy or for a Walmart or for a Target to sell a cell phone and have that consumer walk out the door and pay AT&T 100 bucks a month. I mean, you're, you're, the, the phones are $2 or $3 and they're seeing that reoccurring revenue walk out the door. So I think there's a lot of constituents in the marketplace today that would love to keep captive that customer. And I think that's the whole kind of thesis as to how we've been looking at the market and how we've been attempting to change um, because it's all about controlling the customer and there is um, that dynamic I think will play a big role in the future and I think that with the, with, with the, the importance of connectivity, um, you know, you talk about Walmart or Target or even Best Buy and the ability to walk in and immediately get instantaneous connectivity. You know, I, I, I tell people like, in my office today, I have no idea who I'm buying my wire, my wireline capacity from. I mean, I, you know, I have no idea. I don't think that should be any different. Um, so I kind of look at it like that, and I hate to think about it as a commodity, but it is like a railroad. Well, thank you very much for coming out and sharing that with us, and uh, it was great.